the people in these episodes were nice enough to speak with me and I wanted to return that favor. So I'm going to announce some of the events they have coming up here in Madison. First one is the Valentine's Market and Pub Crawl. It's on Saturday, February 10th from noon to 5 p.m. The event says that you can shop over 40 vendors with a drink in your hand. That's happening at the Bowes Meadery at 849 East Washington Avenue. And on March 2nd and March 3rd, Booth 121 will be participating in the Vintage Shop Hop. They're expecting to showcase over 400 plus vintage shops and boutiques in Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin. You can go to vintageshophop.blogspot.com to learn more. If there's an event that you would like mentioned on the next show, you can message me on Facebook at American Bandito or send an email to tom at americanbandito.com. Now here's the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. Each week this season, I'm talking to 10 Madison businesses. Now, these businesses include the Yellow Rose Gallery, the Stone Fence, Anthology, 11000, Booth 121, Hatch Art House, Confectionique, Mother Fool's Coffee House, Bohemian Bobble, and Pieces Unimagined. I wanted to know how they helped promote local art and creators and how they took their own creative ventures and turned that into what they do today. We learned last time about the terrifying chance they all took when they decided to say, you know what, I'm just gonna open my own place. But why a place? I make websites every day and I know for me, it's easy to just create a store online in no time. I can even promote it and sell things without ever leaving my house in most cases. There's even little to no overhead if you're an artist. So the question I wanted to ask everybody this week is, what made you decide to open a physical place rather than an online business? So as an artist or creator, if I asked you this question, what would your answer be? Maybe you think that you're not computer savvy. Well, you're not alone in that. Mia from Stone Fence feels the same way. I am not computer savvy, that's one thing. And this is, I feel like I have more control over this versus an online. Somebody comes in off the street, they make a purchase. You have this great, warm, fuzzy experience. Online, it's like, oh my God, I gotta get that to the post office. I gotta do this, I gotta, I mean, it's kind of a, kind of a pain. Do you think there's a difference between being able to walk up and see it as opposed to? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think we've all bought things online. You get it at home and you're like, oh, that's not, that's not what I thought it was going to be. Like the order by mail type of stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Sea monkeys, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yes. And particularly if it's anything locally made, you want to pick it up and see it and feel it. How did you find the money to do it? I took out a loan. That's it? That's it. (laughs) I had, I had decent credit and I took out a loan. Wow, okay. <laughs> it seems so simple. Yes. <laughs> How long did it take you to get it into shape for yourself? I mean, I know you have your husband helps with a lot of that. He, he did do a ton of it. I would freak out while he was here getting things done. So. <laughs> 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 uh, it didn't take, it took us about maybe two weeks. Man, all you did, you just asked for a loan, it took you two weeks. <laughs> How do you make the most of using this neighborhood? I mean, it's a great neighborhood to be in. This is. This is my neighborhood. I mean, I grew up on the east side, so it just felt like home here. Mm -hmm. And the people that come in, you know, they're the parents of who your kid goes to school with and their teachers. And, I mean, they're people that you see every day. It's very community-oriented. When my wife and I were talking to Laura from Anthology, she talks about a disconnect from looking at a picture to seeing things up close. Coincidentally, you'll hear somebody going through the buttons on the table we were sitting at during this question, so that kind of proves her point, I would say. It's about getting people to put their hands on things, also getting people to really look at things and say, oh, somebody made that, or to think about, oh, maybe I can make something, you know? And so to me, it's like the essence of it requires a brick and mortar. I get that. Did you purposely <laughs> choose State Street from your history of being here? Because it's a hard street to work on. It's hard, but there's no place I would rather be. I think of it as like an intertidal zone. So you have fresh water and salt water, and you have beach and land meeting each other, and you have people from everywhere in the world, and they're all coming and they're mixing here. And, you know, there's a lot of times people come to Madison, and this is the only piece of Madison that they see. You know, there's like, a, there's a lot of hustle involved in being in this location. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But my old boss used to always say, 
it pays for itself. Yeah. You know, it's not cheap, but if I was somewhere else, you'd have to pay more in advertising. I think, especially for our store, I really wanted to encourage people to think about what they can do creatively and just kind of invite people to think about making something, mm -hmm. you know, doing something with their hands. And I think there's so many people for whom that is so far away. Their life is so cut off from that that they, they walk in here and they're like, oh, I'm not a creative person. And they're like immediately shutting themselves down. And I, I mean, I work to try to like just tempt them a little bit. Like it's really gentle, but you know, like just try it. But all of those people would never make the effort to get in their car and drive to this store because they would have already dismissed us. Mm -hmm. You know, they would say, that's not for me. And so instead, we just basically, like, lie on the sidewalk here on State Street, and they trip over us and <laughs> come in the store. <laughs> so. That actually might be a good advertising play. <laughs> yeah. What made you decide to open up not even just more than a few stores down from your previous I know place. That was, well, to me, my vision was so much about the creative element, which had been so missing from there yeah. that it didn't seem to me that um, it was going to be a problem. And I think ultimately my boss, my old boss, agreed. And so we basically like called all of our friends. You know, they, there are some dressers that came from their attics and the garages and just scrounged together the furniture. And we started out initially a lot of consignment artists and then our own things. There was quite a lot of just getting products from artists and making it ourselves. What do you mean your own things? What, what type of things? that We have prints and onesies we make the buttons here there's probably like 30 really? percent of what's in the store is designed or made by my sister or, or myself really mm -hmm. so it was always about inspiring customers to be creative but also providing a venue for our own creative work okay. and then although you can't really tell it this table here is where we have craft parties and different craft projects. And so it was also about creating a space for people to come and either be creative here or to take things home and be creative. How often do you do that? Not as often as we thought. Oh. And then we ended up, the buttons, the political buttons kind of just exploded on us. Yeah. So they've become a real permanent fixture. Sarah from 11000 does do online sales, as well as opening a studio that people could use. She told me about how she struggled with the idea to open a space and how she learned something from her involvement with pop-ups that motivated her way of thinking. She also tells me about how she used an interesting social funding company called Kiva. Well, we do sell online as well, but that's been like a big thing that I've wrestled with because there's so much you can, there's so many different ways I could take this business and a lot of it could just be pop-ups and, and, and online. But what I've found is like the heart of this whole business model is really the membership base and the community. And people, there's something to having a brick and mortar that people can drop into that really solidifies that community. A lot of our members might be all over the Midwest having like this home base where we can, it mm. just makes it more real, I think, for some people and more official. And then like the energy that happens when people are working in here on a regular basis. But I still think that it's not one without the other anymore. This business is actually going to thrive, financially speaking, more so from our online activities than it will from anything that's happening in this space. We sell creative supplies online. And right now I'm in the midst of really ramping those up. So this is kind of a fun thing that actually happened is when we were starting with our pop-up events, one of the programs that we started with was our creative workshops. And so creative workshops to me are a fantastic way for our professional makers to share their skills, build a community around what they're doing, build an awareness about the beauty of handcrafted, the empowerment of handcrafted, and also helping people understand why things cost how they're made and why things cost what they cost. So we did those creative workshops and as we were developing them, we needed to source creative tools and supplies. And one of the classes is beginner tapestry weaving. So we needed to find looms and tools and the source that I had is from a maker in New Mexico. I was commenting one day on how it would be nice if these tools were a little bit different. And one of our members is a product engineer and he's like, well, how do you think they could be different? 
I'm like, well, they just don't hold the yarn very well. And then our instructor, Melissa, was giving her feedback and how she'd want them different. And so we developed our own tools. And now John from Human Crafted makes all of these proprietary tools for us that now we sell online. Right now, I'm working on scaling those. We're working on really making that a strong revenue stream and bringing those on Amazon. That's what I mean. Like, I think that that helps us reach a broader community less service-based revenue stream, whereas everything else takes so much manpower and human power. And this allows us to like bring revenue online too. And he, he develops those himself, or I'm sorry, he, produces them himself yes. is what I meant to say. Yeah, really? Yeah, by hand. We might get them, uh, what is it called? I, like, I don't know all the engineering stuff, I don't which either. is beautiful because I don't need to, he does. <laughs> right. But there's like injection molding might okay. be something that we'll do in the future if we get in higher quantities. But How yeah. do you know the supply and demand and all that? Well, so. Most so our membership base, eighty um, percent are product makers. So that's a common issue for a lot of them. It's okay. the like getting to the point where how do you actually like run a business and make the product is part of it. Mm-hmm. And then when you get to a point where you actually want to make a really sustainable income, how do you scale? And what does that mean? Like how much can you actually produce, or do other people need to start producing it for you? And then how does that supply chain work? It's a whole whole mm-hmm. different growth pattern. Yeah. So Kiva Zip, if you've not heard of it, is fantastic. I highly recommend it. It was a very good experience. So I secured ten thousand dollars through Kiva Zip. Hmm. And Kiva Zip is a crowd lending platform. Your credibility comes through your social capital. So if you have a strong Instagram account, strong Facebook account, that gives you some leverage with them. Hmm. And you actually have to have a business plan. But the business plan can be all different types. Like you need a new piece of equipment or you want to start a whole business from scratch. But basically you show them that and with a simple application you get approved. And then they tell you that you need to get 20 or 30 people from your own network to be your first lenders. And they have to lend $25. Once you get that, they're like, okay, people believe in you. We're going to believe in you and open it up to our community. And they open it up to their community worldwide to crowd lend the rest of it. And it's 0% interest, which is amazing. That is amazing. So Kiva Zip, I think for like any entrepreneur or creative person or small business person, it's really good to look into. Okay. And then the rest of it I got through Wisconsin Women's Business Investment Corporation. They support women and minority-owned businesses. Okay. They helped me secure part of that money came through a city grant or a city loan, I should say, at five percent, and then they give you the rest, and you also get a consultant with that. Oh. So I think they're another really great resource because they really want you to succeed, whereas a lot of lenders are just like, "Here's the money, you right. better figure it out." It's funny, you hear so many companies explain that's how they got started. There was something they were doing and the tools they needed just weren't right. So they made their own. And her networking from pop-ups helped find those people. And of course, we can't mention pop-ups without talking to Tammy from Bohemian Bobble. This question was a strange one to ask her because she started with a brick and mortar store and then closed it. But she still doesn't really sell online, which of course fascinates me. I don't do online right now. And the biggest reason I don't is because most of my items are one of a kind and mm-hmm. that's the way I like to work. The idea of having to crank out 20 pair of the same earring kind of makes my skin crawl. Okay, <laughs> valid. But I'm going to have to start doing that because I do need to get online and, and doing the one of a kind thing online is going to be way too time consuming and mm-hmm. there's going to be too many issues with that. So I'm going to have to change the way I work. What yeah. made you decide to do pop-ups? I think the, the very first one I did was on the tip top patio. Okay. which you came to one of those shows. Yes. I was there for lunch one day, and I went, oh, my God, this would be a great space to have a little show. That was it. That was it. Uh, you've heard of pop-ups before? Or? No, they were just kind of starting to happen, okay. I would say. They were just starting to come. Pop-up was just starting to become a thing when when I started with the, with the Tip Top show. Did you do any research, or did you go, I'm just going to show up here one day. Are you guys cool with that? Yeah, I just went in and was like, hey, d- what do you think about having some artists set up on your patio like on a Sunday for six hours or whatever we'll bring a bunch of people your your bar bill will go up that day your food bill will go up and we'll sell our stuff yeah and they were like absolutely let's do it no cut no nothing no but not everybody does that they're generous that way some places some establishments do take a cut 
Okay. Which is understandable. I mean, you're yeah. using their space and all that good stuff. Of but course. And how did you find the other people to do I this with you? I know so many people. Like, most of my friends are artists. So okay. When I had my shop, my world of friends opened up so huge because I met so many amazing people mm -hmm. that started out as maybe just a customer became a friend or started out as an artist in my shop, became a friend. And from doing so many shows, I do all the street festivals in town, Willie Street Fair, Atwood Fest, Lafette. I just meet, I'm super friendly and I'm chatty and I like to meet the other artists. So I, I know a ton of people to do shows. The, it's easy to gather them up. What type of stuff do you need to create a pop-up? You're not getting a building. You're setting up in different places. Yeah. Do you have a standard setup? Like how do you plan for that? So the biggest thing is you need a space. Mm -hmm. You got to go somewhere and say, hey, can we come in here? Right. And then you gather your people. And most everybody has a certain setup that they do when they do a show. Maybe it's just one six-foot table or two six-foot tables or yeah. whatever it is. Everybody's usually already got their thing. So you just let somebody know this is how much space you can have at this show. And then they work within that space. So you don't do like a cart thing or anything like nope. that. Okay. Mm -mm. Which makes sense because you're saying you don't know where you're going to be put. Right. When you look for locations, what do you look for? Uh, so you you were at the tip top and you did, as you've described to me, that it was kind of like, hey, what if we did this here? Yeah. So how do you do that to other places? You just show up at places and go, I'm yeah. gonna ask these people. Yeah. Really? <laughs> That's what I do. And you just walk up. So Rockhound Brewery just opened on Park Street like two years ago. So that's in my neighborhood. I, I have these uh, two other artist friends that we do lunch once a month. And I was like, let's go do it at Rockhound so we can scout it out. And right. so we get there and then I'm like, who's the owner? Nate, Nate, come here. I got, I got to pitch you an idea. And I pitch him the idea. Now he hasn't done one yet. He's okay. still thinking about it. Okay. But every time I go in, I'm like, hey, Nate. And he's like, yeah. I know, I, it's still on my mind. Most places are pretty open to the idea. How do you build up the supply and demand for what you're making? Once you do that, your supplies have been diminished. So, I mean, how often do you have to take breaks to make more stuff and then do another one? Most of the artists that I know have a day job still. So mm -hmm. they started just like I did. So they work their day job during the week they craft at night mm -hmm. and then they do shows on the weekend. For me, I work during the week making my things and then do the shows on the weekends. Do you need anything from the places aside not, from? Not really. Just right. the space. Like, uh, I'm, and at a lot of places, like, I'll say, I'll move all the tables so you don't have to do any of that. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll make the space. You just have good service for people that want to come and drink and eat. I like to do them at bars because who doesn't like to go to a bar and have a cocktail or a, or a bite to eat when mm -hmm. they shop or meet a friend or whatever. So I tend to look at bar slash restaurants for pop-ups. I've gone to a couple of the pop-ups that Tammy has been involved in, and it's quite a community of people working together for the same goal. I'd never really experienced this kind of, for lack of a better way of putting it, storefront concept before. You heard me mention how Anastasia lets people do pop-ups in her parking lot when she has an event. But what made her decide to have a physical building, especially since she was only going to be open a few times a year? You put so much work into being in a craft show, hauling goods, setting up, and waiting and waiting and waiting for people to come to your table, look at your goods, perhaps buy something, to at least meet the obligation that you initially had to pay to be there. It's a lot of hard work, and it's going from show to show to show oftentimes. I want to nest more, Clearly. Steve, obviously. <laughs> and, you know, people come into my shop and they'll say, no, wait, you close for all that time, your stuff stays here? Yep, I nest. <laughs> I can't help it, I nest. Mm -hmm. And then I, I've had on, I have at three Etsy shops that I've actually put on hold. I don't care for working with Etsy. It's a lot of work. I've heard that a lot. Yeah, they just don't make it easy. I get it because I'm a web developer. So for me, that all makes sense. And I'm like, well, that's not that hard, but I get it for people that don't spend every single day in front of a computer building websites and messing with computer interfaces that walking in and seeing this is different than seeing a picture of it. Or when somebody comes in and says, I sort of have this really good idea, but I'm just not sure how to make it come alive and mm -hmm. so we can sit and talk about it well we could try these things and what do you have at home that we could put with it you just can't have those conversations about creativity my partner at the time and i were able to get this space at a very good price to start 
And it was sitting vacant for a while. And I wondered sometimes if that's not a good way for other shopkeepers to kind of look for opportunities, go look perhaps for a space that's been sitting vacant for a while. A person who owns it would love to have somebody in there doing something with it. I see what you're saying. So it started out with that and truly cobbled. I I mean, I was bringing stuff from home Mm -hmm. to use as displays. And I was going to garage sales and secondhand stores to see what I could fix up and bring in as displays. One of the nicest compliments I got is a woman who came back. She came like the first year we were open and she never came back until the October market. She said, this is a complete transformation from where you began. And I'm like... Thank you. Yes, it's taken forever. Yeah. Yeah, but honestly, I encourage people, go check out Habitat Restore. Go go check out garage sales or Craigslist and see what you can do to, to work with products that are already out there. And you can dress them up and put them in your shop and use them for a while until you can bank a little bit of money to do something else Mm -hmm. more expansive in your shop. I've just never been about getting loans or we just sort of make it work. The other thing is, if something's not going, try something different. If if that thing that you've got out right now, it, no one seems to be interested in, pack it away for a while. And then maybe a year or two, bring it back out again and see if people like it yeah. better at that time or abandon the idea altogether. I mean, listen to your customers and what they like and what they expect. If I don't have a successful market, it's always a, an opportunity to look at what did I change? What did I do that people didn't want me doing? Always have a mission statement and goals to go back to and build from. That's always best. Kyle of Pieces Unimagined, he also sells one-of-a-kind things. But there's an obvious reason, he tells me, that he doesn't sell online. This stuff is too damn heavy. Yeah. <laughs> Shipping has got to be a pain. I mean, you have a website, but you don't have an online storefront. No, we really don't. I mean, you can buy stuff off of it, but that's not our thrust. It's really, you got to see it. You can't tell that it weighs 450 pounds. There's a lot of people recreating industrial modern furniture, and it doesn't weigh anything, and it's made of a brittle cast iron, mm-hmm. on and on and on. And all of our stuff is like top notch. I just challenge people to push our tables. Like just try to make the table wiggle. Yeah. And you can't. And so you're not going to get that online. We participate, of course, in gallery night. And then we make it a big to-do. And then we've got like three other events. So when I came on the street, I saw that there was a growing number of retailers. So I started a... Merchants Association, mm. and so we had, that's called We Are Willie. We coordinate our efforts right now to do events, and they are evening events, and like we'll do free wine and beer pourings, free analog music or live music, hors d'oeuvres, and it's basically just say have fun. A lot of people say they just love to just sit here. And that's the night you can do that. Oh, what made you decide to start that organization? I was thinking I would have more time, and I wanted <laughs> to, to develop it and be like State Street. So that's what the goal is. Okay. And we just need other people to step up to the plate and be able to do the things it takes to get there. But we do get uh, the, the events are incredibly successful. Yeah. You know, they're like seven fifty to twelve hundred people that come in between five and nine. But we want a map, and we want a better web presence. We have a a web page but it's you know not it's not great <laughs> so we have goals but yeah. it is just to tell people this is a good shopping uh, corridor and it's a hip, hip shopping corridor will it be for cry right. <laughs> you know Previously, Leah from Booth 121 talked about how she used to show her stuff right out of her storage space. Her business partner, Rebecca, tells me about how she found the space that they would eventually open the store in. I was driving down Monona Drive, and I noticed a big four-lease sign right there, and I just flipped a UE, and I was looking in the windows, and I called the number. We had checked out a couple different spots. We knew we wanted to be on the east side. Mm -hmm. We looked at a place on Atwood. It was too much, too much. We couldn't spend that much we didn't want to take that big of a leap then we looked at another place on atwood which we were thinking of but we really wanted to have my workshop on site so when we found this place i love monona i love this area great outlet from the west side monona needs another place a place like this and i have my workshop right on site so Mm -hmm. it's perfect i can be here be here working when it was slow and then a customer would come in i was able to help 
And Tammy from the Hatch Art House never thought twice about having a store instead of selling online. Oh, that was never a question. Um, <laughs> there is just, you really need to see the work and experience it in person. I mean, nothing against online stores. That's not what I, I don't think I would be very good at it, honestly. I, I do enjoy being in the shop and working with customers and especially people trying to decide what kind of art they want to have on their walls for the very first time. Do they come up to you and say, I'm looking for something like this? Mm -hmm. really? Yes, all okay. the time. So yeah. I'm going to do that, actually. I'm looking for a soap dish. So well, we have some. <laughs> we were, we were going to wait till after this, but we ha also yeah. have a purpose to be yeah. here. Yeah, we have some great potters <laughs> in here, so. I wanted to be on Willie Street. It reminded me a lot of, of Portland and some of my favorite neighborhoods mm. there. Very eclectic, just emerging itself. Of course, this was seven years ago. There was a lot that was changing at that time. This building that we're in right now was built seven years or was finished seven years ago so oh. i was the very first oh, oh yeah it was a parking person. lot wasn't it it was a parking lot yeah <laughs> i forgot about wow. that before that it was a gas station there's apartments upstairs and then we have three shops here <laughs> and i was the first one so i looked at it when it was empty and i had to do the build out and everything these were all new experiences for me i waited tables and i was an artist i was selling my work on my own and doing that kind of thing and i had it experience in working in art galleries and things as well. So when this came on the market, I came here, the landlord was awesome. He was, he really wanted to help out somebody like me that was just starting out a small shop. He did not want to have anybody that was like a franchise of some sort. So I always wanted it to be called Art House instead of Art Gallery because I thought it was more inviting. Mm -hmm. This is this is a house that's filled with art. And Hatch because of the hatching artists and emerging and Hatch is also a form of drawing, mm -hmm. hatch marks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was it's just it means it has a lot of different meanings. They all in one way or another pertain to art, I feel like. <laughs> my my last name is not Hatch. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted you to know that we did end up buying a ceramic soap dish while we were there. It was a lot easier to make a decision while we were looking at it. Mother Fools is a coffee house, so you go there to get coffee, not really a way around that. So I asked John how he dealt with that location and how the coffee house culture has changed over the years. I think the thing that for me has been hardest to deal with though as far as the change in culture is yeah. laptops. Mm -hmm. um, when they first came in, I sincerely thought it was going to put us out of business because one of the things that we loved about our space is we were really different than those downtown coffee houses we had big tables you could sprawl out you could really bring in a group of friends and play a board game or have fun together yeah. and the first wave of laptops were really big they're like these coal-fired steam engine things yeah. you know they're massive it's like you're carrying your refrigerator around yeah <laughs> you set up and they this is my table so all of a sudden you'd have three or four people in here and there's no other effective seating so it's just really weird and people uh, we tried things with little table tents and said please share your table and people got really angry about that huh it was really hard to transition and it's also it was really emotionally difficult for for myself, but also our long-term baristas, when phones came in and all of a sudden people weren't talking to you anymore. I feel like that's swung back again where it's more human, but for a while it's just like if you had a phone or a computer, it seems like now we've got better etiquette again. But, but yeah, I totally thought we were gonna go out of business when laptops came in, it was really hard. So we had to one by one get rid of our big tables, yeah. and put in smaller tables, and we put in side counters where people can sit. That makes perfect sense when you say it, but now coffee shops are so connected to those particular devices. Like, it's important to have Wi-Fi at a coffee shop, right. you know? Do you guys get a deal for Wi-Fi? Or is it a, just the same as everybody else? We have a business account. Okay. Yeah, so it's different than a residential account, but well, it I don't just, think it's And that just popped into my head because it's like free Wi-Fi at a coffee shop is pretty much a given. Mm -hmm. yeah, like you expect mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and so but it costs the coffee shop money it's it doesn't kind of, really cost us more than what we would pay to have our own service yeah that's know, a good we, point. we use the internet in our office and twitter we put out our soup every day on twitter and things okay. like that you know so we, we use internet so we would still have that basic service hmm. 
And of course, it's also pretty self-explanatory why the Yellow Rose Gallery is a physical space. It's a gallery, and you go to a gallery to see people's works. But I did ask Micah how they got their location. The original owner of the gallery had a working relationship with the owner of the building. That goes back a while, I guess. Again, knowing yeah. people, it's so it's crazy. A, it's about knowing people. So we have a really good deal here, and that allows us to have to make use of this, the sixth floor and uh, part of the second floor, which is the main area of the gallery. He owns a lot of stuff in Madison. Yeah, his name's Harold. I forgot his last name, though. That's a weird last name. Colloquially, it's, <laughs> it's just known as Harold. <laughs> During these conversations, I was kind of being swayed to the benefit of opening a physical store. I get that when you see pictures of things online, it doesn't overwhelm you in the same way it does when actually seeing it. But I still have to argue with the reach that one can have if you sell things online. You can't beat that either. I want to thank you for listening to the show today. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to this show at americanbandito.com slash subscribe it's also available on apple podcasts and google play the music for this episode is by romcom that's com with two m's you can hear more at americanbandito.com slash music i'll be asking another question next week so until then so long mm-hmm.